your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Explore the second edition of the Witch's Oracle deck through 45 innovative cards and enhanced guidebook that peers into the world of the witch. The deck's stunning artwork has a new look and includes seven brand new inspirational cards. Each card now includes a suggested crystal or gemstone to enhance your reading as well as a magical incantation that provides energy, reinforces the card's meaning, and helps the desired message to be sent out into the universe. The easy-to-navigate guide also has a new look and offers straightforward, gentle guidance that takes readers through both good times and bad. And now includes a chapter on crystal and gemstone divination by the amazing Nicholas Pearson. The Witch's Oracle. It is a perfect divination deck for witches as well as non-pagans and is designed to suit both seasoned readers and beginners alike. Find out more about the Witch's Oracle deck at www.marlabrooks.com and you can purchase the deck from shifferbooks.com, amazon.com or order a copy from your favorite bookseller. Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Merry meet everybody and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Parax Radio Network. You know, we've all got skeletons in our closet, but imagine finding out that one of your ancestors was a notorious serial killer. My guest tonight, author Jeff Mudgett, made that discovery, and when he did, he set out to find out more about his malevolent great-great-grandfather, Herman Webster Mudgett, also known as Dr. H.H. H. Holmes. And what he found out was truly even more shocking than he could have imagined. We're going to be discussing Jeff's autobi- autobiographical book tonight, Bloodstains, which has been referred to as a unique combination of psychological thriller true crime historical, and an insight into pure evil. Now, Jeff is a California Maritime graduate of 1979. He earned his master's degree in the United States Merchant Marines and was honorably discharged as a commander from the United States Naval Reserve. He went on to graduate from the University of San Diego School of Law in 1986, and from there he practiced admiral. I can't say that word, Admiralty Petroleum and Criminal Law. 
Jeff is the co-founder and editor of Maritime Executive Magazine, and a highly regarded periodical it is, and he's the host of The Mudget Report. So, Jeff, welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Thank you very much, Marla. It is an honor being on with you tonight, and your uh, description of my past is, is the best I've heard yet, and I've done hundreds of shows already. Oh, and we're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> You get going. I mean, now I, I'll, I'll be honest. I have read so much about the book. I haven't read the book, the book, because as you know, we kind of booked you in a little bit late. But I've heard glorious reviews from a lot of people, and everything that I read on the internet is absolutely fascinating. There is a YouTube of you that's on for about an hour answering questions and talking and stuff. Um, but but let's start at the beginning in a sense. How did you find out that you were the great great grandson of H. H. Holmes? Um, that must have come as kind of a shock. You know, Marla, it's uh, that's one of the the big parts of the book. Really, I wanted to explain to people what happens when you're you're you know you're uh, you're proceeding through life. I was forty years old, uh, reasonably successful in California practicing law. And one night at dinner, my grandfather was forced to reveal the secret to the entire family that he had kept to himself, even from my grandmother, the, the woman that he had been married to for 60 years, wow. who wouldn't have married the man had he told her. And this secret uh, was as horrible as anyone could imagine that we were the direct descendants. I was the great-great-grandson of the most evil man possibly that ever lived and uh, when the story the story's coming out more and more each day next year when Warner Brothers brings the movie out with Leonardo DiCaprio starring H.H. H. Holmes uh, the, the real story about this this monster because that's what he was will come out so that the uh, the world will know exactly what was living in Chicago at the turn of the century now I was reading some background information about him. And um, we're going to talk about the murder castle in a minute. But, um, I mean, I was reading kind of like the M.O. around here that he selected mostly female victims from among his employees and other people. Um, and, and with the employees, many of whom were required to take out a life insurance policy as a condition of employment and make him the beneficiary. beneficiary and he tortured and he killed them, and some were locked in soundproof bedrooms fitted with gas lines that let him asphyxiate them at any time. Um, some victims were locked in huge soundproof bag vault near his office where they were left to suffocate. I mean, the victims' bodies were dropped by secret chute to the basement where some were meticulously dissected, stripped of their flesh, crafted into skeleton models, and then sold to medical schools. Um, I mean, he cremated some of the bodies. He placed some of them in lime pits for destruction. He had two giant furnaces as well. Um, used various poisons. He had a stretching rack. I mean, oh my God, this is absolutely amazing stuff. You know, usually, I don't know that much about serial killers, but but usually they just kind of have one modus operandi. He had a whole a suitcase full of them. You've explained it uh, incredibly well. He murdered for profit. He was a fabulously wealthy man. He probably invented uh, life insurance fraud. You're exactly right. The employees and women that uh, were his mistresses were required to name him as a beneficiary, and when he was tired of them, he would collect by murdering each one of them, then selling their skeletons to the medical schools around the country uh, that, that was his big business, skeletons to the medical schools. His were, his were known as the most pristine. Um, and then the organs, whatever he could get for those. But the man was an evil genius, um, one of the highest IQs ever recorded, graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School. And the um, basement, as you described it, in the murder castle, it, obviously it wasn't called that at the time. Right. It was a hotel that serviced the uh, Chicago World's Fair and uh, the, the hundreds of thousands that attended the fair. Um, well, but the, uh, the, sorry, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, let's talk a little bit about that, why it was the murder castle, what it was, and and his his um, ideas about why he built it in the first place. Well, it was probably the greatest example of premeditation there ever was. He knew that the World's Fair was coming to Chicago. He planned out where the transportation system would have to transfer He planned out a hotel which would service that transfer. He knew that many people would come late and would be preparing for their greatest day of their life the next day. They would need a hotel to stay in. And he spent two or three years building this perfect hotel with uh, this horrible basement down below which would service his needs and uh, allow him to uh, murder and uh, take advantage of the uh, profits that he could obtain without anyone knowing. Think, think about it. You've got, you've got hundreds of thousands of people coming from all over the country, all over the world, without our systems of communications, um, letting their parents know that they were so excited and they were coming to Chicago to see the greatest spectacle there ever was. That's what they, uh, the fair was sold as. Um, they uh, they found this beautiful little hotel with 20 rooms and a spectacularly elegant, well-dressed doctor who was the host. They uh, they uh, rented a room for the night, and uh, the ones that he selected, Marla, were never seen from again. Yeah. Um, what year was it, approximately? About 1892, 1893. Okay, yeah. I mean, he was he was like he he was like somebody at a big old buffet, in a sense. Um, he could pick and choose what he wanted from you know any number of people. It's kind of amazing. When, well, when you get the book I sent you, I sent you a signed copy. When you oh. get it, the the uh, prologue starts out with uh, my best estimate of uh, how he would have selected one of the young ladies that came off the train that needed a place to stay that night, how his assistants would have directed her to the room that had the uh, the gas lines to it once she was um, asphyxiated or rendered unconscious, depending on what Holmes needed from her. They would send her down a, gre- a greased chute to the basement where they would be waiting with the gurney. The body would land on the gurney, would be strapped down, and then he would commit his... Uh, his murder and surgery, um, exploring uh, the things that uh, he thought he could uh, render from uh, this unfortunate victim. It was, uh, you know what, it was far horrible than anything Hollywood could imagine. And I can't wait to see how they render it next year with the movie. My friends tell me at Warner Brothers, Marla, that they're not going to do it with the blue screen. They're actually constructing a copy a life-size copy of the murder castle with the basement. Oh wow! Now that's that's fantastic. Um, I mentioned earlier that that most of his victims were female, but I also read where a few men and some children were um, were killed as well. But somebody in chat who knows a little bit about this said that. Um, he also attempted to kill his own children. Do you know about that? Because she says you're you're lucky to be here. You know that she's she's very right. It's, as a matter of fact, the trial that he um, was uh, subject to uh, was the result of uh, three children that he killed, the, the Petzl children. He was never tried for any of the murders he committed at the murder castle. Now, most of the men that he murdered were men that. Uh, irritated him or got in his way in some fashion. Mm -hmm. The women were the ones that he used to uh, collect the profits. He was a fabulously wealthy man, Marla. You're talking in 1892, 1891, him probably making three or $400,000 a year. Wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty serious money. Now, after the World Fair, um, I read that he moved to Texas and built another murder castle, for lack of a better word, there. Um, and that's where he was eventually caught. And, and there was a question from chat, how was he eventually caught? But it was in Texas, right? 
You know, the, the Fort Worth material, I have so much, Marla, that comes in, and I'm concentrating on, on the, on the uh, issues that I have in the book, uh, proving uh, as many as I can true. And they're, and they're big issues, and it takes me quite a while and money. But uh, the Fort Worth issue about him building another hotel, I'm not an expert on. That, uh, I get uh, material sent to me every day now about uh, homes, and quite often it's about the Texas material. But uh, to tell you the truth, I would uh, I'm not I'm not a uh, I'm not uh, knowledgeable on that yet. Now um, there are legend that he was arrested in uh, Arkansas for stealing a horse. There is legend that he was arrested in Pennsylvania. My guess would probably be more toward Pennsylvania for a life insurance fraud matter or a uh, theft, which mm-hmm. was then um, extended into the uh, murder of the three children. And also there is a speculation about how many victims he actually had. I mean, it goes anywhere from 7 to 200. That's a pretty broad range. Where do you think the numbers lie? Much higher. The, he, he admitted to 27, but... In the, you, you have to um, imagine this man sitting in his jail cell awaiting execution, and every day the media would come interview him, the New York Times, the Chicago papers, all the big, all the big papers, they would come. He was a prolific liar, as much a liar as he was a murderer. He loved to fool people to play chess with their minds. That admission that he gave of 27 was ridiculously low. I know Eric Larson, the incredible author of The Devil in the White City, estimates that it is 200. My guess when we find out about the exact nature of the glass factory in Chicago, which obviously was used because of the incredible temperatures that are used to make glass to uh, eliminate uh, human waste, I think when those, uh, the actual, you know, functioning of that is, is, uh, established, you're going to have uh, many more than 200, perhaps three, four, five hundred. Wow. And nobody will ever know for sure. That's, but, but still, you know, even two or three horrible murders is bad enough. Serial killers take that to a whole new level. And again, this guy was, was the devil incarnate in many ways. And, and see, that's the thing. Cleverness can sometimes be very dangerous. Um, and he obviously was. So, the, so... The law... Say, go ahead. Me. Well, no, law, I... enforcement had, law enforcement had no chance with him. He, his intellect was so incredible. He, he was so far ahead of them. Um, he played with them like toys. And uh, that's why when we get into uh, later in the hour the subject about his... Uh, escapades in, in London, I'll, I'll be able to explain to you how he used that intellect to, uh, they never had a chance, and I, they, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, interesting to speculate why he allowed himself to be arrested here in the States to uh, be subject to, to the trial that everyone writes about. Um, I still haven't figured that exact answer out, but, uh, and I don't know if we ever will. But uh, it still it fascinates me, and I'd I'd love to uh, dig up a little more about that one day. Mm-hmm. Now you did. I mean, you're doing extensive research on this. You actually traveled to Chicago, to the site of the murder castle, which is now, I believe, a post office, if I'm not mistaken. But the eerie part is, the foundation is the same. They use some of the same bricks. I mean, you know, from a paranormal standpoint, that's got to be a horrible, horrible place to work. I was it fascinated me, Marla, that the post office could have been built over this horrible place, and that nothing had been done to honor the uh, well, ten, twenty, thirty, hundreds of victims there. Um, No monument, nothing, and it, it bothered me. When I read through the, the many books about Holmes, I couldn't find any author who had even tried to go down into the basement of this post office, which it's not built over the same foundation of the murder castle, but it shares a small part of it. Okay. And, yeah. And so my friend, uh, Kim Estes and I, um, 
we, and I write about it in the book, it's actually the chapter is when we visited the post office. Um, we, uh, we, it took us three or four hours to uh, get permission to go down into the basement, which was sealed. They mm-hmm. didn't use the basement. They considered it haunted. Um, mm-hmm. None of the employees wanted to go down inside, and they had sealed it up and uh, barricaded it. Well, the assistant manager of the post office decided to uh, let us go down inside, and the custodian, one of the custodians, was not afraid. And uh, I tell you, when I went down the stairs, Marla, I, I did not believe in the paranormal. I did not believe in the supernatural. I didn't even believe in God, to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. An hour later, when I came back up, I didn't know what I believed, but it certainly was that there was an energy down in that basement which had something to do with all the murders that had been committed. Mm-hmm. Well, in cases like that, there is a lot of residual energy that stays. It doesn't have to be an active haunting for a place to hold on to very strong memories, particularly bad ones. So, obviously, it is kind of a tainted place, but... You also, um, in the process of writing, encountered some roadblocks of the paranormal kind kind of on your own. Um, If I'm not mistaken, he might have been around. You know, the book, Marla, I'm glad you brought that up because the book is about me trying to come to grips with finding out that this evil thing was in my background and the way it changed my life. the book, I wrote it in a fashion that when one of my readers gets into the book, um, they, they take my place, and it becomes an experience for them what would have happened to them had they been in my shoes. And I write it so that the voice and the visions that I saw and heard uh, will be experienced by the readers so that uh, everything in life changed for me, Marla, everything. And... That's what the book's about. Sure, I write about, you know, the history of H.H. H. Holmes and uh, Jack the Ripper, those things. But it's more about what happens to someone who's just gliding along with a normal life, uh, nothing unusual, and one day, bang, everything changes. Everything about good and evil, everything about everything you ever believed in. And it was quite a shock to my system. It would have to be. I mean... And for you to write it in that perspective where where the reader will be in your shoes, that just makes me think I'm going to have to read it during the day. Um, (laughs) Because after dark, I might not want to. Um, But it's just, it's it's fascinating because now, you know, in a paranormal sense, they say that people on the other side can hear us. They know when we're talking about them, um, that you can call them in. Um, providing they haven't reincarnated or something. So just the idea that this is your great-great-grandfather and you're doing all this research, you're spinning your wheels, it, it's almost like there's a sign in the ethers pointing down to you that, that he would be attracted to you, that he would be around during this because what you're doing, I mean, what you're doing is telling the truth, but in a mind like his... Perhaps he thinks you're glorifying him, or you know, not letting him for not letting people forget. Not that they would, because his story is so terrible. But you know, you would be the perfect target for him to be around during that time, and and you know, now doing the interviews, talking about it on your shows, doing the book signings, whatever. Um, that that in of itself is creepy. Exactly correct, and. And uh, I know uh, you know this, um, Marla. I'm I'm uh, epileptic, and when I write the book, I have two sides of a story. My neurologist, I explain in the book how my neurologist says these things that I saw, these things that I heard, were simply the result of seizures, um, and he uh, prescribed medicine for me. Where others believe that this thing that um, started uh, influencing my life was more than an epileptic seizure. And I let my readers decide uh, uh, what side of the story they want to take. And uh, I have many of them come back and say, you know, Jeff, what what bothers me the most was as I read your book, 
I started becoming fascinated with this abomination. I actually started liking him, and that uh, that seems to bother a lot of my readers, Marla. Mm -hmm. I imagine it would. Now, um, we're going to jump around just a little bit here because I want to talk about the fact that he was incarcerated and that he was um, allegedly hung. Um, there is some information that you found out about that that is quite compelling. And then we'll talk about Jack the Ripper. But this is this is something that you probably have a lot to say on about his his trial and the subsequent hanging and the conditions that went along with it. And your suspicions. Yeah, it's a fascinating subject. And um, you have to understand that this was a man who, when the trial started, fired his lawyers and then conducted his own defense. Uh, and that's the way he was. He had every paper in the country there. He had uh, mistresses in the, in the, uh, in the uh, gallery. Um, he, he was an incredible story. What happened when the jury came back, and there was no doubt they were going to find him guilty, but when the jury came back and uh, found him guilty and then the judge sentenced him to be hanged, the press noted seeing Herman making a list of names on a piece of paper. When they let him off, he took the list with him, and uh, proceeded to wait to be executed in the uh, in the gallows at the at the prison. Every day, the the uh, newspapers would come and write an article about, and I and I describe this exactly in the book. They would describe an article about how this man was changing appearance before their eyes. And Marlo, you have to understand, he was a master of hypnotism. He could look into. The judge actually instructed the jury not to look into his eyes. He was a master of hypnotism who could make you see things. Um, this is not this is not me making up a story. This is written about in the New York Times. Um, they started writing about how his face was elongating, how the features of his nose, his ears was changing, right in front of them in the cell. Hmm. Well, when he was taken out to be hung by the rope, by the neck until dead. He had the judge allow him to wear a uh, cover over his head, and then he had the judge, uh, in uh, violation of uh, Pennsylvania law, not have an autopsy done. The body was lowered down from the gallows, set into a coffin, filled with concrete. I don't know if I've ever heard of that happening ever before. Mm -mm. The concrete... A concrete-filled coffin was led off by a mule team to a cemetery outside of um, in, in, in Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, um, and was and lowered into a hole, a ten-foot hole, Marla, which was then filled with concrete. Hmm. That was guarded by the Pinkertons, who he had hired to watch over that no one would mess with the concrete before it hardened. Then, the New York Times started writing about the Holmes curse. Evidently, the names on that list he had made, 40 almost, either died or suffered terrible misfortune. And that it was actually written about up in the papers, the New York Times front page. Um, they thought it was supernatural that this, this ghost spirit thing was coming back from the dead. Well, uh, when I was um, interested in the story, when I was researching the facts, I started think, taking a different uh, perspective on what could have happened. I started going back to each newspaper article, breaking them down, seeing what the reporters were doing every step of the way before that body was lowered into the coffin. And I came up with an interesting idea. He wasn't hanged. The guard was hung in his place, and the mudget, the Holmes curse that they all wrote about later was actually him visiting these people who had either irritated him in his arrest, in his trial, or in the execution. Wow. Um, so that now what we're going to do, and uh, I need to arrange quite a, quite a bit of money. It's an extensive uh, procedure and process. But we're going to dig up the concrete. We'll, we'll get permission to exhume it. We'll dig up the concrete. Uh, the Smithsonian's already said they're interested in taking possession of the concrete to make sure that it's done right. We're wow. going to crack it up. 
We're going to crack it open, and then we're going to take a piece of tissue from my body and compare it with the DNA of the remains in the concrete. I'm convinced, Marla, that it's not him, that he lived long after, and he went and visited everyone on that list. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would that would make sense because that's just the type of guy he was. Um, so, all right, so let's go on the theory that that was not him, that he was not hung. I know you did a little bit of digging around, and what became of him then? How did he escape, if you know, and what became of him after the alleged hanging? Uh, once the concrete hardened, and they all thought he was in it. It was a blank check for this uh, evil genius who all of a sudden his whole life had been wiped clean and he could travel away and then uh, experience uh, a new life. And uh, that's going to be obviously hard for me to track down. But one of the great things about that part of the book and my theory, Marla, is that uh, there's so many authors that write books now, so many ones that have conjecture and imagination in, in their nonfiction pieces. This one, when we dig that concrete up and do the DNA, it's 100% yes or no. We will know if I'm right or not. Um, if I'm right, obviously, uh, uh, we, we need to start rewriting history and start looking for where he went after that. But if, I, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll stand up and be honest about the whole thing. And uh, mm-hmm. he was... He was hanged and he was put to death. It just doesn't make any sense. And when you read the book, Marla, and the chapter about uh, when he was put to death, and uh, uh, allegedly, and the body was taken out to the uh, cemetery, you'll see that the newspaper articles just don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Just got a, you were talking about, in the chat room, they're all talking about this, and somebody mentioned DNA. And, sorry, we're going to be talking about Jack the Ripper very, very shortly, but there's a question in the chat room, is there any evidence on Jack the Ripper? So, possibly they could connect the DNA between the two. I don't know if we'd be able to establish any DNA uh, evidence about Jack the Ripper. Now, I tell you, it's a great question, because there is one thing that I intrigues me, and obviously this is getting far, far out, but if if the federal government would ever allow me to excavate the property outside the post office where the murder castle basement was, because when they bought the property, it was in 1937, Marla. I can, I'll send you a picture with a, a nice little pickup truck next to the murder castle. <laughs> okay. They, 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 they took it down. Um, uh, I think they simply filled in what was left and then moved the post office a little bit to the side. We had some nice uh, outlines um, of the exact um, layout. But Mm -hmm. if the federal government ever allows me to excavate the property, and I'm going to submit a request, I doubt they will, but maybe one day when the post office closes, uh, I'm convinced there will be evidence um, uh, dug up by the professional uh, scientists and archaeologists, um, which may be evidenced from uh, London and uh, about Jack the Ripper, because this property was built in, he bought the property in the summer of 1888. The property, the hotel was started being built in the spring of 89, exactly uh, when Jack the Ripper was over. And I'm convinced that if we do it properly, as you said, there's still the same uh, brick down there. There's still some of the brick tunnels in the existing post office from the murder castle. Um, he had secret compartments down below. He talks about them often. Um, there may be direct evidence in the ground of Jack the Ripper. Now, that's that's me speculating. I don't have anything to uh, firm that up with, but uh, quite quite possible. That's the way he was. He liked to keep those type of things. Now, as far as yeah, don't all, evidence. Don't all, sorry to interrupt, but don't all ser- serial killers have kind of like souvenirs, something that they keep? I guess maybe I'm I, watching Dexter too much or something, but I've kind of heard that, that they all keep little bits of evidence. And I can't believe that with all those murders that took place, I don't care how much acid or quicklime or, you know, whatever else they were doing, there has to be traces of, of stuff left over. You know, there's no way that he could have cleaned up so perfectly after every murder. 
I, I agree completely. Plus, he liked to collect valuable things, Marla. He liked jewelry. He liked, you know, the, the, the items in the woman's, the women's purses, those type of things. He would have kept the knife he would have used in London, those type of things. And that's where, obviously, where he would have kept them in his secret basement where he committed the worst atrocities known to man. All right. So let's, let's, um, talk about the Jack the Ripper connection. Where from and what are some of the you know, <clears throat> sorry what are some of the reasons? I'm sorry no just what are some of the reasons that we're putting pieces of the puzzle together about that well you know that, let's put it in perspective first I, I um, brought it up in the book and actually one of the pub, first publishers that uh, offered uh, me a deal uh, demanded that I take the section out about him being Jack the Ripper because they thought it was so crazy and I refused. Um, I was warned by a couple of authors that had written stories about Jack the Ripper already that they had been completely unaware of the reaction they would get from the world, really from the world, about anyone that writes about a suspect of Jack the Ripper. It's... uh, it's something that causes an anger that um, I think a lot of people haven't figured out yet. And when I try to explain to a crowd, you know, the perspective we're talking about, this this is a man who killed hundreds probably, and Jack the Ripper at most five, maybe six. Um, yet this is the greatest true crime, crime mystery in our society, and it's the one that causes the hairs to go up on the back of our neck when someone mentions Jack the Ripper. And I still haven't quite figured it out. But when I started uh, breaking down um, why so many suspects of Jack the Ripper don't work and why law enforcement, the Scotland Yard, had such a hard time identifying a proper one, um, it started fitting. And I think that I have a uh, a theory with a with. With, with the puzzle that we put together about it being homes that makes a lot of sense. Now, do we have a video? Do we have fingerprints? Do we have DNA proving homes, Jack the Ripper? No. No one ever will. Probably not. But we, uh, but we have something that makes sense and it, it excites me to be able to tell the world about it and, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's starting to, uh, catch a lot of people, um, people's interest and I'm getting asked to go talk about it. So when, think about this, Marla, we're talking about Jack the Ripper who killed probably, like I said, five people. Now, according to the FBI, there are 50 active serial killers in the United States right now alone. Killers Mm -hmm. who make Jack the Ripper look like an amateur. 50 (laughs) active ones, 50 right now. Um, Holmes was probably the one all of them should be measured against. Trying to go through my notes here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. I had a a man that writes strictly about serial killers on my show the other night. He was explaining to me the three things that serial killers do. They can either stop, Marla, they can either die, or they leave an area. Now, he said serial killers never stop. They can't stop. They have to keep killing. Um, Mm -hmm. Two, if they die, which many of the authors about Jack the Ripper have said that Jack the Ripper died, they all leave evidence where their body is or where they lived regarding their crimes, all right? Scotland Yard or the London detectives would have found evidence if Jack the Ripper had died. That leaves he left by ship, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the only way you could go back then. We also know that Holmes disappeared from Chicago in August of 1888, and he returned to start his hotel in January of 89. The time fits exactly. We also know that he was 27 years old and he was a doctor. Now, when I start one of my talks, um, I'm instantly objected to by four, by four, they raised four objections, Marlon. They say, hey, he couldn't have been Jack the Ripper. He was a Chicago doctor. I said, okay. He was building a hotel, okay. There was an ocean in between, okay. 
and ocean lining was very expensive. That's the four things they tell me make HH Homes impossible. I simply asked him, so what? Um, he was a Chicago doctor, okay. He liked to travel. I can prove he liked to take liners. He was building a hotel. As we said, we can prove that he started in the spring of 89 when the Ripper was finished. The ocean in between, Kennard had liners back and forth between New York and Southampton that took eight or nine days for transit. And as you and I have already discussed, Holmes had three or 400,000 years. He could have bought a, a ticket on a, on a ship quite easily. So we know that it was possible for him to have been there. Then they raised the issue of uh, MO, modus operandi. They say that the Ripper slashings were not the same as Holmes. Well, I asked him, what do you have on Holmes as far as an MO, how he killed? Well, we don't really have one. I said, that's right, because most of his killings were conducted in a basement that were never even tried. But we know that the first two killings of the Ripper, and this was interesting, after I raised Holmes, I actually got a call, Marla, from the London detectives saying that for decades they had believed it had it was a doctor the first for the first two or three murders the last ones were copycats and mm -hmm. the reason they thought that and I don't know how deep you got into uh, the study of the Ripper but the first two killings um, when they did the autopsy the pathologists all say in the autopsy that the man who did that who removed the uterus the ovaries and the liver and kidneys from uh, in some combination from the first two bodies had to have had an incredible surgical ability. No one could have done, a car driver couldn't have done that. Um, you, you take a hundred suspects that they have about the Ripper in history and you can eliminate 95 of them just because of those first two pathology reports. Here was a man that in four minutes time, Marla, in the fog, in the dark, opened a woman's abdomen and removed her uterus. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible to, to have had a skillful surgeon do it. You had to have somebody that had a lot of practice. That puts right. you right into Holmes' ballpark. Mm -hmm. Then you go to the University of London Medical School, Marla. We can prove, and they have records of this, that an American doctor visited them in October trying to sell skeletons to their medical school, just like Holmes did here in the United States. That was his business. He skeletons to medical schools. The University of London has a record of that. About 20 years ago, the and this is an interesting concept that most people don't understand, there was at least 13 eyewitnesses of Jack the Ripper. Um, that's, this is in the records of the London detectives in Scotland Yard. This is why I get a chuckle out of uh, the stories about this latest uh, one about Jack the Ripper have been, uh, having been a woman, um, which is pretty hard to uh, put in place with the, with the eyewitnesses at the time. But the uh, BBC had a professional artist do a rendition of the uh, face of Jack the Ripper um, based on these eyewitness uh, testimonies. Uh, when mm -hmm. you put that rendition up against the photographs of Holmes, it's uh, shocking how similar it is. Oh. Well, after, and one more, one more uh, I'll give you. Um, one more. After I published the book, Marla, I had a man named Mark Potts um, contact me who had said that he had proof that Holmes had written the uh, Dear Boss and the From Hell letters, the, uh, Jack, the famous Jack the Ripper letters. Um, I, I said, well, I... Bring your evidence on. Let's 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 review it. It seems he had gone with Holmes's notes, the ones that Holmes had done while he was in prison, awaiting execution. So you can prove that it was Holmes, and he had taken them to the British Library in London, who had recommended their finest uh, forensic handwriting scientist. They had reviewed the two Jack the Ripper letters with Holmes's notes. We have her conclusion, Marla, and I can show it to you. Absolutely, without a doubt, she says it's the same. Now, having been a criminal lawyer, I knew that the Supreme Court about 15, 20 years ago had said that 
um, handwriting expert analysis was not enough to send a man uh, uh, for capital punishment. It was just you could get an expert to say yes, you could get an expert to say no. The um, Department of Justice and the Postal Service needed forensic handwriting in their business. They had created, they had hired a, uh, a man named Sargur Srihari at the University of Buffalo who had created a computer program which would run millions of dots into each letter to compare handwriting analysis. I called him and asked him if he would run his uh, computer program through the, the Dear Boss and the From Hell Jack the Ripper letters and the, and the Holmes notes. He agreed, and we came up with a 97% number. Wow. Now, I knew that 97% was a, was a good, strong number. To be fair to him, he said that his program did not run cursive the way they did handwriting of English at that time, and he wanted, he's still working on making another program. But yeah. I knew that naysayers and the ripperologists would say, no, that doesn't prove Holmes was Jack the Ripper. It proves Holmes wrote the two Ripper letters. So I yeah. went to the... Uh, yeah, because it doesn't prove he had the scalpel in his hand. They're right. right. It proves he was there. It proves he was there in London at the time. I went to the London detectives and uh, told them that, and they said, "Listen, we've known for a very long time that whoever wrote those two letters had more knowledge of the murders than you could obtain from reading the newspaper articles." And the knowledge was right. They said so. Um, that's, that's about where we are in placing homes in London with knowledge of the murders and then um, having um, evidence from eyewitnesses that it was a man that looked a lot like him. So we're, we haven't proved it. We haven't absolutely proved it. I don't know if we ever will. But we have circumstantial evidence, which um, is used many times in, uh, in trials in the United States and criminal courts. So uh, mm -hmm. we're very we're very close, and it's a, an exciting concept for me, and I like to stand up in front of a crowd and discuss Holmes being the Ripper. Yeah, well, it is amazing. There are a lot of um, similarities. There are a lot of what maybe some people would call coincidences. I don't believe in coincidences per se. I think everything is destined to be what it is. But um, there is some compelling verbal evidence, written evidence about this, and it makes a whole lot of sense. It makes a great deal of sense. And oh, you're going to continue digging around, yes? Oh, yeah. No, this is a fascinating subject for me. Plus, um, uh, they've raised my uh, interest uh, being as, as nasty as they can be about me. Uh, listen, I, I told them, let's have a good, honest debate. Let's do it with manners so you don't need to call names. All you have to do is bring a picture to me of H.H. H. Holmes with a date on it here in Chicago or, or New York, and uh, you can. it's much easier for you to prove he wasn't in London than it is for me to uh, prove, prove he was. I'll tell you another thing, Marla. We now know the ship that he rode over onto London. It left, it left New York. It reached Southampton. It was called the Etruria, and it was there seven days before the first murder. And check this out. We got a list, a passenger list, and there is a Holmes on the passenger list. We are asking the shipping company now if there are any ticket purchases or documents with his signature on it that we can uh, tie into his handwriting. So every day we find something new, and uh, it's just uh, an exciting, fascinating subject. And uh, I really want to thank you for letting me come on the show and discuss it. Well, it is. It, it's amazing. I mean, it's grisly on the one hand, even without the Jack the Ripper tie-in. <clears throat> I mean, what a heinous serial killer this man was. And um, then when you add that, it's like the cherry on top. I mean, this is something, and I know that, that you've spent hours and hours and years on research now on this, and you're still, it's just the tip of the iceberg in a sense. You're exactly right. You know, and uh, it's. Uh, I tried to, to uh, give your listeners as much as I could in the 15 minutes we had about the Ripper, but I have almost 30 pages in the book about him being Jack the Ripper, and I really wish they'd give it a chance because 
I have to tell you, Marla, the more people that read the book, the more information that comes to my Facebook page and my ebook page, um, I get a lot of new information. And I'll guarantee you, Marla, one day I'm going to get a piece of evidence that seals the deal, and it's going to be from one of my listeners or one of my readers that has something they didn't know correlated with Holmes and Jack the Ripper. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, we've done so much talking about this book. Um, where can people find out about it? Where can they get it? Where can they find out more about you? Let's let's give them all the good stuff um, because there is at least one person that I know, and, and I got a private message too. They want to know where to get the book. Thank you, Marla. You can you know you can get an ebook on Amazon on, on the Kindle. It's uh, just bloodstains one word. You can go to uh, my webpage, uh, www.bloodstainsthebook.com, bloodstains the book, all one word, no spaces. Or we're, our sales are doing so well now, just just put bloodstains up on Google and we're at the top of the first page. And I tell you, <laughs> I'll, yeah, and we're doing, we're starting to do well. It's been a long time. We've had a lot of hard work over it. But I'll tell you, and I'll do something for you, Marla. Uh, been just, it's uh, been an honor to come on your show, and I've had a great time. I don't sign books unless I'm at a signing or a conference um, normally, but if they say that they're friends of Marla, um, when they order the book, I'll have my manager send them a signed copy tonight. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you so much. You might have the signature of the great-great-grandson of Jack the Ripper. (laughs) Or at least the world's most uh, scary serial killer, too. Um, because somebody in chat earlier brought up the fact that um, Holmes, as a serial killer, probably killed more people than any other serial killer on record. There's that- no doubt about it. He was. There's no doubt about it. Now, obviously, you have military, you know, the, the personalities we all know about from history that were in the millions, Hitler and those people. But this man is a true crime, infamous, you know, criminal. He was yeah. the most prolific of all time. And we'll, like you say, acid baths and urns and furnaces. We'll never know exactly how many there were, Marla. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's the scary part. And as I open the show talking about skeletons in your closet, boy, that's, that's, not, <laughs> that's an interesting, fascinating one to have, but a little bit scary on top of it. Now, we're just and- about... Uh-huh. Well, let me um, let me make one more comment, okay? Um, I, I like to say this, this. This book is not for children. It's for very mature people. It's not horrible. It's not gory. But it will take you in. It's almost like you will feel you're next to the voice and the vision. And it's not for children. I really uh, I would uh, rather not sell it than have anyone under 18 read the book. Well, thank you for saying that. I think that's an important um, thing to bring up. Now, we're going to be out of here in a minute, and you've got to get ready for your show, The Mudge Report. So do you want to quickly tell everybody about your show? You know, I've got a little radio show on Blog Talk Radio, which uh, we uh, uh, have just started for two months. My manager, Susan Sherman, and I, who she's just incredible. Tonight, we've got one of the actors from uh, the Sons of Anarchy on, and we're going to talk about motorcycle riding uh, with all the stars and and uh, auditioning for different parts, and we're kind of, uh, I'm looking forward to it a lot, but I really appreciate you letting me say it. It's the Much Report, and it's on blogtalkradio.com. Thursday night at uh, 7 o'clock Pacific, yes, every Thursday? 7 o'clock Pacific in about uh, two minutes. I imagine my manager's getting quite upset with me right now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks for coming on, and um, we've had several requests for you to be back. So I'm going to have you back really soon. People have questions for you that we didn't ask tonight. So look for look for a, an email or a, a Facebook note from me because we're going to get you back really soon. I tell you, I want to come back, Marla, because uh, I should be getting the air date. The, the History Channel uh, has done a show about my book and uh, the Murder Castle basement there at the post office. They took me down and filmed it. And I'd love to come on your show and talk about the show when it comes out. That's great. Let me know when, and you'll be there. How's that? That's a deal. It's a deal. Thank you very much. All right. Well, you take care, and I want to thank everybody who is in listening tonight. We had a really good crowd and a lot of questions, like I said, and they really um, 
it's a fascinating topic. What can I say? So thank you, everybody. And until next week, blessed be and marry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more fun. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2009. You have been listening to the Para-X Radio Network. 